Um, just before, I f I'll forget at the end, so the best way to contact me, I think when your information sheet comes out, my cell phone number should be on there, my email should be on there, you can text me, you can email me, uh, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, uh, all of those, if you search for Dan Davis, you'll search all day, because there's like 87 million Dan Davises in the world. Uh, but if you search Pastor Dan Davis, that's Facebook.com, Pastor Dan Davis, Twitter, same thing, Pastor Dan Davis, Instagram. Uh, I'm still figuring out how to use Instagram, but I do post there. Um, Your wife. Yeah, she'll help me. Uh, but I would love to stay connected with you. I'd love to hear from you, how I can pray for you, encourage you. So uh, please do stay in touch. It has been an amazing, amazing blessing to get to share this week with you. So thank you. Uh, you have been an encouragement and a blessing to me. It has been a privilege to share life with you. Uh, this week and it is going to be really really hard to leave. We'll be at breakfast tomorrow and then leaving afterwards so if you want to say goodbye do it sometime between now and uh, breakfast tomorrow. Well obviously this week we've been talking about becoming who we are and it's, it's just my great great passion and great desire that, that every single one of you would know and understand and embrace who you are in Christ. That you would truly see yourself the way God sees you because we have an enemy, Satan, who loves to deceive us about our identity. If there's one thing, he cannot take away your relationship with God, right? The Bible says nothing can separate us from the love of God which is in Christ Jesus. If Jesus is your Savior, nothing will ever, ever change the status of that relationship. But Satan will love to confuse you and deceive you about that relationship. So always Always remember who you are. Don't believe his lies. When, when he whispers to you that God doesn't love you, that God doesn't care about you, that God has forgotten you, that God has been unkind to you, remember that you're his child and that he gave up his son to purchase you. Remember your worth and your value. When he tempts you to think that you're a failure because of your sin, because of your mistakes, remember that you're a priest to your God with access to his throne room. Not because of your righteousness, but because of the righteousness of the one who paid for your sin. When Satan tempts you to sin, when Satan tempts you to, to disobey God and dishonor him, remember that you're his, Jesus' his bride. That you're pure and you're holy. It will help you. Re remember when you find yourself longing to fit into this world, that this world isn't your home. That you're an alien, you're a stranger. And not only are you an alien, but you're an alien on a what? Mission. You're an alien on a mission, right? You have a divine destiny and a divine purpose. And the last aspect of our identity that I want to share this week ties into the key to fulfilling that divine destiny and that divine purpose that every single one of us have in Christ. And so this morning, I want to challenge you to think of yourself as a bond servant, all right, it's not a term that we use in, in today's world, but it was a term, it was a word that was well known among God's people. And it was a word that Paul and Timothy and James chose to use of themselves as they described themselves, in fact, as they introduced themselves when they would write to the church. And, and this picture of being a bond servant is an Amazing picture. Very briefly, I want us to jump back into the Old Testament this morning to Deuteronomy chapter 15. Because there we find the foundation for understanding what it means to be a bond servant. Deuteronomy chapter 15, we're going to look at verse 12 and then verses 16 and 17. And, and there God's word says this, If a fellow Hebrew, a man or a woman, sells himself to you and serves you six years, in the seventh year you must let him go free. All right, slavery, indebtedness was a way to, to pay off your debt. And so you would become indebted to someone, you become their servant, become their slave in order to pay off your debt. But God made a provision that six years was the maximum term and in the seventh year you'd be set free. But in verse 16 we also see there was another provision that God made. It says this, but if your servant says to you, I do not want to leave you because he loves you and your family and it is well off with you, then take an awl and push it through his earlobe. Say, ouch. <laughs> ouch. Push it through his earlobe into the door and he will become your servant for life. Do the same for your maidservant. 
And so God makes this provision because what would happen many times is that someone would go and they would serve their, their term, but when their term was up, they didn't want to leave because they had developed a loving relationship with the one that they served. They became almost like family, and so they desired to stay there because they were better off with them than without them. And so they chose willingly of their own choice to say, I want to live as your servant for the rest of my life, that I believe this is the best way for me to live the rest of my life. And so if someone made that choice in and of themselves, they would go through this ceremony where they would take an awl and they would pierce their ear to, to mark them as, as this decision. They would seal that decision. And so this concept of being a bond servant is the concept of being a willing servant. A willing, one who willingly attaches themselves to another to serve them. And as believers in Jesus Christ, we have become bond servants of our Lord. We become bond servants of our Lord. And here's the thing. Apart from Christ, right, we were hopeless. Apart from Christ, we were dead in our sins and our trespasses. We were cut off from God. We were in debt to God. Right, we have a debt that we cannot pay. We owe an insurmountable payment to God for our sin. Every sin demands payment. Every sin must be atoned for. And the weight and the guilt of our sin is far, far greater than we could ever hope to pay for. And so Jesus chose to pay our sin debt. And so instead of us being pierced, He chose to be pierced on our behalf. He chose willingly to go to the cross for you and for me. He chose to lay down His life to become the sacrifice for our sins so that we could be set free from the bondage of sin and we could become servants, bond servants of Christ. Listen to how Peter describes it in 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 18. Listen to these words. He says, For you know that it was not with perishable things such as silver or gold that you were redeemed from the empty way of life handed down to you from your forefathers, but with the precious blood of Christ, a lamb without blemish or defect. That's the price that God chose to pay for you. That's the willingness that he had to bring you into a relationship with himself. He says it wasn't with silver or gold. He says it was something with so much more valuable. The blood of Christ. The perfect lamb of God. The one who lived a sinless life on your behalf. The one who died a sacrificial death in your place. The one who rose from the dead to defeat the power of sin and death and of hell. And the one who now offers you and I eternal life. And in offering us this eternal life, this living relationship with himself, he calls us to see ourselves now as belonging to Him because He's redeemed us. He's purchased us. He paid the price of our debt. And so now we belong to Him. The rightful way to look at our life is now it's not my life anymore. It's God's life. He purchased me and He calls me to live as His servant. Isaiah described what Jesus did for 700 years. 700 years before Jesus even came, Isaiah said this, He was wounded for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. And the chastisement that brought us peace was upon Him. And with His stripes, we are healed. You have been purchased by God. We have been purchased. We belong to Him. Your life, if you've come to faith in Jesus Christ, Right, if you've come to that place where you say, I believe that Jesus was who he claimed to be, based on the evidence that's there of Jesus' life, based on the evidence of his death and his resurrection, which are all attestable facts of human history, based on the evidence, right? And that is ultimately our greatest hope. Where does our faith lie? Why do we believe? Why do we choose to stake our destiny to Jesus Christ? It's because he rose from the dead. And believing that and, and knowing that, we realize I belong to God and I'm to see my life as a bondservant of Jesus Christ. And here's the thing, it becomes really critical to see your life that way because now we realize that we serve Christ not out of duty, not because we have to, not out of guilt, right? Have you ever felt like you should do something for God, you sort of felt guilty or made to feel guilty that you weren't doing more for God? Right, but that's not the right motivation for serving God. We serve God out of love and out of privilege. We've been privileged to become His children, privileged to be His priest, privileged to be His bride, privileged to be aliens in this world, and privileged to be His bond servants. I want to share a story with you this morning about a young teenage girl 
who was given the opportunity of a lifetime. In fact, I wouldn't even call it the opportunity of a lifetime. I would call it the opportunity of an eternity. All right, it was the most incredible, insanely incredible opportunity. But in order for her to say yes to this opportunity, it required her to say no to all of her dreams, all of her desires, and all of her plans. To say no to her rights in order to take upon this opportunity. She was a young Jewish girl, a teenager. She lived in a town called Nazareth. She was engaged to be married. All right, in their culture and in their time, this was normal for her age. And so you might imagine she's planning her wedding. She's planning her life. She's engaged to a man named Joseph. So by now you probably can guess her name is what? Mary. Mary. She's engaged, right? And Joseph is a carpenter and, and he's building them a home to live in. And I'm sure she was dreaming about what it was going like, to look like when it was finished. I'm sure she daydreamed about her wedding and the details of her life. It was all coming together. Joseph was a godly man. He was a man of integrity and character. She had found a great man to marry. He had asked her hand in marriage. She could hear the, the, she could see into the future, hear the sound of children's feet running through her home. Her life was coming together. Her life was planned out until it was radically altered. You know the story, but look with me in Luke chapter 1. The Gospel of Luke, chapter 1, and verses 26 through 38. It says, In the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent from God to a city of Galilee named Nazareth, to a virgin betrothed to a man whose name was Joseph, of the house of David. And the virgin's name was Mary. The Lord is with you. But she was greatly troubled at the saying and tried to discern what sort of greeting this might be. And the angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God. And so here we find Mary, she's, she's living her life, she loves God, she's, she's honoring God in the way she lives, she's planning her life, she's engaged, and she is interrupted one day by an angel's visit. And it says she was greatly troubled by this saying and by this appearance. She was shocked, just like you and I would be, right, if we experienced something like this. And so... She, she hears this message. The angel look at, says, he says, do not be afraid. You found favor with God. What, what that means is God is pleased with your life. You have found approval before God. The way that you're living is pleasing to God. And I don't know about you, but, but when, I, when, I, when I read that and I think, okay, I'm living a life that's pleasing to God. I'm, I found approval with God. That means that God's going to honor what I want to do. Right? right? God's going to bless my plans now. God, you know, and have you ever thought that way? I know I used to think that that's how it worked. In fact, I struggled for a long time because as I was in college and then in seminary, uh, a lot of my friends began to date, become engaged, get married, and I was still very single. And I thought, God, I, I, I'm, I'm doing everything. I'm trying to live for you. I, I have my quiet time in the morning. Right? Like, I'm, now you owe me something. Right? I, now I deserve for you to fulfill my desires, but it doesn't work like that. And so, listen what happens, verse 31. It says, Behold, the angel says to Mary, You will conceive in your womb and bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus, for he will be great and will be the Son of the Most High. And the Lord will give to him the throne of his father David, and he will reign over the house of Jacob forever, and of his kingdom there will be no end. And Mary said to the angel, How will this be, since I'm a virgin? Right, the angel says, you're going to have a baby before you're married. All right, that wasn't part of Mary's plans. That wasn't part of Mary's dreams. That wasn't on her radar. In fact, she has no concept. How can this happen? And so this angel shows up and says, Mary, God approves of your life, but God is going to radically shift your plans and change everything. And so he presents her with this amazing opportunity, right? He says, you are going to be the one through whom God brings the Messiah, the deliverer, the salvation of the world. He's chosen you to bring him into the world, to be his earthly mother, to raise him and to nurture him and to care for him as he grows up. What an amazing opportunity. What an amazing calling. What an amazing privilege. But it required her to say no to everything that she had dreamed. She had no idea what it would cost. She was overwhelmed. Look at verse 35. 
As she's confused and struggling with, what does this mean? How can this be? This can't happen. The angel said to her, the Holy Spirit will come upon you and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. Therefore, the child born to you will be called Holy, the Son of God. And behold, your relative Elizabeth, in her old age, has also conceived a son. And this is the sixth month with her who is barren. For nothing will be impossible with God. And so all of this brings Mary to a moment of decision. As the angel Gabriel assures Mary, yes, what you heard is shocking. Yes, what you heard is really hard to grasp. In fact, you can't understand it. But God can and God does things that go beyond our understanding, beyond what we know. And he says, the Holy Spirit will come upon you. What I have said will be made possible because of the power of God. And nothing, Mary, nothing is impossible with God. And so all of this brings Mary to this point of decision. What will she do? How is she going to respond to this interruption? Look at verse 38. As she thinks about letting go of her dreams and her desires and her plans, she says, Behold, I am the servant of the Lord. Let it be to me according to to your word. And in this monumental moment, Mary says one huge yes to God and one huge no to herself, to her dreams, to her plans, to her desires. She was able to do this. Why? Look, look, look very carefully. How did she see herself? She said, I am what? The servant of the Lord. She says, my life really isn't mine. And so God, if you want to interrupt my plans, if you want to change my, my dreams and my desires and my destiny, I'm okay with that because I am your servant. You are my master. And so it was Mary's understanding of who she was in relationship to God that enables her to say yes to this incredible plan. Nine words that she says that forever changed her destiny. Nine words that changed the destiny of her entire life. Let it be to me according to your word. Let it be to me according to your word. Saying yes to God opened her life up to some amazing, amazing privileges. Here we are, over 2,000 years later, talking about her still, right? Her name is known everywhere. She's most honored among women because she said yes to God. But here's the thing. It did not make her life easier. In fact, it made her life much, much harder. Saying yes to God meant she had to deal with a doubtful fiancé, right? You know, you know, you just imagine, you know, a couple days later, her and Joseph having coffee, a little cafe in Nazareth, you with me? And uh, she's, she's like, I was going to text him this, but I probably should tell him in person. Um, uh, Joseph, I, you know, I love you. Oh, yes, I know you love me. I'm so excited. I love you so much. She said, Joseph, uh, I, I love you too, and I'm so, still looking forward to our life together, but just one little thing, I, I'm pregnant. <laughs> After Joseph gets up off the floor, right? <laughs> Are you with me? And, and, and I was like, Joseph, and he's just like, he's more hurt than anything. He's like, how could, Joseph, don't worry. It is God. God did this. <laughs> it's like, all right, Mary, just, just come clean. Right? And, and Joseph wrestles with it. And, and the Bible tells us that he wrestled with it deeply and he loved her intensely. And, and, but he says, I just, I can't do this. Like, I, this is crazy. And he had it in his mind to end their relationship. And so when Mary said yes to God, she knew very well that Joseph may never understand, but if God in his grace and his mercy also comes to Joseph in a dream and says, what your fiancé told you, she was speaking the truth. Do not be afraid to take her as your wife. I'm sure, the Bible doesn't tell us, but I'm sure there was an awkward conversation with her parents, right? And then the town, right? Small town living. All right, anybody live in a small town? All right, how fast does information travel in a small town? All right, very quickly, can you imagine the talk of the town? Hey, did you hear about Mary? Oh, Mary's pregnant, right? She says it's from God, right? We know better. In fact, God's so bad, she had to leave town and go stay with her Aunt Elizabeth for a while. Saying yes to God did not make her life easier or comfortable. She had to endure the difficult travel to Bethlehem from their home in Nazareth to give birth. And we often romanticize it, but it wasn't easy traveling over 60 miles through harsh terrain when you're ready to give birth. She had to give birth in a barn. 
She had to raise a son that she knew ultimately was not her own. To feel all the things that a mom feels for a son, but to know he's not really truly mine. She had to watch and endure that son being brutally and humiliatedly killed on a cross. Saying yes to God did not make Mary's life easier. But it opened her up to the greatest privilege in the world. Saying yes to God does not mean that life is easier. It meant an end to her dreams and her desires. But here's the thing. God's plan for your life is infinitely greater than anything, anything that you could ever plan for yourself. God can write a better story for your life than you and I could ever write for ourselves. You know, so many times we want to be the author of our own story, don't we? We want to make our plans and our dreams. We want to do it our way. And God says, if you're mine, if you're my child, I want you to see yourself as who you are. You are my bondservant. You belong to me. I redeemed you, not with gold or silver, but with the blood of my son. I purchased you. I paid the debt and the guilt of your sin. I love you with the most intense and incredible love that you could ever know or imagine. And now, because of that, I want you to see yourself as my servant, willingly giving up your life for Christ. And so I'm going to ask you today, what would happen if you chose to see your life that way? What could happen if you said, I am the servant of the Lord? Are you willing, are you willing to say yes to God with your life? I, I want you to, to think about that question today. I want you to consider it deeply. Are you willing to say, God, my life is one big yes. Whatever you want. Wherever you want me to go, whatever you want me to do, would you be able to say with Mary, let it be to me according to your word. Nine words that changed Mary's destiny. Nine words that could change your destiny. God has a great plan for your life. God redeemed you and he purchased you because he loves you. And in his love, he has given you purpose, meaning in life. Right? We are aliens on a mission. And living out that mission requires us to see ourselves as a bondservant. Is there an area that you're holding back? Is there something that God's prompting you to do? Is there an area that you're just saying, God, no, no, I will not do that. I won't do that. I'm going to do this. I've got my plans. I've got my dreams. And if that's you, I want to invite you today to lay down your dreams and to lay down your plans, to hold them out like this before God and say, God, here's my plans. Here's my dreams. God, if they're yours, then fulfill them. But if they're not yours, then you can change them. You can have them. You can take them because you love me. You gave yourself up for me and I am your bond servant. Isaac Watts, the great hymn writer, put it this way. He said, but drops of tears can ne'er repay the debt of love I owe. Here, Lord, I give myself away. Tis all that I can do. He says the most reasonable response to this glorious gospel message that we were ruined sinners, destined to an eternity, separated from God, but now we've been redeemed, purchased, bought by the blood of Christ, given new life, given eternal life. He says the greatest way to now live your life is to say, Lord, here it is. The most reasonable response to the gospel, the greatest act of worship that you and I can ever give is to say, God, here is my life. It's the greatest way to live. 20 years ago, God began the process of interrupting my life, right? I, I had no plans and no desires and no dreams to be doing this. And I sensed so clearly God calling me towards ministry. I just thought, this is crazy. And I would love to tell you that that night I heard God's voice and I said, let it be to me according to your word. But I didn't. I just tucked it away and I thought about it and then I thought, no, I'm not going to pursue that. I'm not going to do that. And over the next couple of years, although God was definitely at work in my life and I was starting to live for him, my, my focus was certainly better, but I was not completely surrendered to what God wanted me to do. People would, I was in, went to community college for a couple of years, people would ask me, oh, well, what do you want to do? Which is a reasonable question to ask somebody that's in college, right? And I would say, I don't know, don't ask me that. <laughs> I, I don't know. And I knew, but I didn't want to say. And God 
in his graciousness, orchestrated circumstances in my life over and over again to get my attention. Right? He's patient and he's gracious. And finally, after three years, I fully surrendered to that moment. And I can still remember it so clearly. I was in a church service in Lynchburg, Virginia. The pastor was giving an invitation and some people at, you know, down south that do these come forward sort of invitations. And there were some people coming forward saying, I want to give my life to Christ as my Savior. And I was like, man, that is awesome. That is great. I just, I felt great. And then the pastor stopped the invitation. He looked out and he said, God's calling a young man here to preach. And you've never publicly surrendered your life to Christ. And I was like, <laughs> I was like, he did not just say that. I am not doing that. I am not, no way. This is the first time I've ever been to this church. But I did. And I want you to know it was, it was the greatest moment of peacefulness and surrender. Because listen, although it's scary and although it's hard and although it will not make your life easier, saying yes to God is the greatest decision that you can ever make. And it will open up opportunities for you to serve God and experience Him and know Him like you could never imagine. Will it make your life easier? No, not necessarily. In fact, it might make your life shorter. Jim Elliott, you know, who, who many of you have heard his story, his wife Elizabeth just passed away this past year. Many, many years ago, God called him into missions. He was smart. He was athletic. He was strong. He had, could do anything he wanted, but he believed God was calling him to reach an unreached people group in Ecuador. And ultimately, he ended up giving his life to make the gospel known among a people who had never heard his name. And the world would look at Jim Elliot and say, you're an idiot. You could have done anything you wanted. You had a great life. You were strong and athletic and talented and incredibly smart. But Jim Elliot had said this, he is no fool who gives that which he cannot keep to gain that which he cannot lose. There's nothing greater in life than giving your life away to Jesus Christ. Paul said it like this. He says, I don't account my life of any value nor as precious to myself if only that I may finish my course and the ministry that I've received from the Lord Jesus to testify of the gospel, the grace of God. My greatest desire, my passion for each and every one of you is that you would know God for who He is. That you would see Him in all of His glory and His splendor and His majesty and His power. That you would understand the love He has for you that you would receive his salvation, and that you would live your life as his child, as his priest, as his bride, as his alien, and as his bondservant. And I believe that God could use you in incredible ways. God took Mary, and he used her to bring Jesus into the world. God wants to take you and use you to bring Jesus to the world. You're his plan. Would you surrender to that plan? Would you bow your heads today? And just very quickly. I want you to, to just think, am I willing to say yes to God today? And then here's the thing, you've got to say it tomorrow and every day. But if that's your desire this morning, would you just raise your hand and say, I want my life to be one big yes to God. I, I, I'm scared a little bit about what that means. Would you just raise your hand? Just, I say, I'm scared a little bit what that means, but I'm willing to trust the Father who loves me more than I can understand. Thank you for your honesty. I want to pray for all of you this morning. Father, I thank you for the great privilege of, of, of getting to be part of this ministry once again. Father, thank you for this week that we've shared together and how good you have been in this week. We've shared your love, your word. We've shared laughter, food, fun. We've shared incredible music and learning and growing. Father, I thank you for that. I pray now that you would help everyone who's honored you this morning by raising their hand and saying, I want to say yes to you. Father, seal that commitment in their heart and give them the power by your grace to say yes to you every day. May we live as your bond servants. And I ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.